Hey, welcome to Puget Sound Foursquare Church. My name is Caleb and I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you so much for tuning in to our church at home service today. As we kick off, Pastor Laura and the Sound Worship team will be leading us in a couple of songs of worship. And we're jumping right in. Will you pray with me? Dear God, I thank you so much for this wonderful Sunday. Lord, we ask that your kingdom come and may your will be done today for us. And you say I pray. Amen. All right, worship team, we're turning it over to you for a powerful time of worship.
Wasn't that awesome? Would you go ahead and do me a huge favor by clicking that like, follow, and subscribe button? Some of you are watching our service for ver the very first time, and we wanna make sure that you're plugged in and connected with what's going on. Wanna take it a step further? Share this service to your timeline for your community to see our church. You never know the lives that will be impacted by simply clicking that share button. Speaking of sharing, here are a few events that are happening here within our church, and we would love for you to come by and be a part of it. Sound Married, mark your calendars for Saturday, July 24th, and join us at the Clark's home for a relaxing hangout and del delicious apps and s'mores. This will be a time filled with fun and building friendships within your church community. The event is free and space is limited, so sign up today. There is nothing more sweeter than standing in front of your church family and promising to raise your little one to follow Jesus. Join us for this special time during our regular services as we stand in support of our families who wish to dedicate their child. If you are a family who wants to dedicate your child at our next Dedication Sunday happening next weekend on June 20th, then fill out the interest form online today. What is Foursquare Missiology? Join Pastor Chad this Thursday, June 17 at 6.30 p.m. as he talks about the way in which Foursquare approaches missions. You can expect to learn about Foursquare Missions International, Foursquare Disaster Relief, and engagement with the global Foursquare Church and how we at Peaches Sound Foursquare link in. To find out more, details including registering for the event, sign up online. Hey church, we're going to go into a time of tithes and offerings. I want to invite you to participate with us here at Peaches Sound. We want to love God, to love people, and to be the mission of Jesus. One of the ways that you can partner with us is through your giving. Your giving allows us to have church every week, host community events, and to spread the good news. Your giving also opens the door in your own life for God to show up with His miraculous provision. There are three ways to give. You can either give through our website, through the Church Center app, or you can go ahead and mail your check into the church. The address will be on the screen right now. However you give, will you put your trust in the Lord? All right, kids, it's time for Kids Corner. I'm turning it over to our kids pastor, Pastor Diane. Are you ready? I'm gonna send it over to you in three, two, one. Hi kids, welcome back. This is Kids Corner and I'm Pastor Diane. This is our second week where we're learning about the epic adventures of God's people in the wilderness. Well, last week we learned about the traveling tabernacle, but this week we find out that God's people are at the edge of the land that God promised them. They had questions like, what is the land like? What are the people like? It'd be like you moving into a new neighborhood and you might take a trip to see the new school that you're going to go to, or even check out any new playgrounds around your house. So Moses picked 12 people, one from each tribe of Israel, to go and spy out the land. Well, they returned, and 10 of the spies were afraid to move into the Promised Land because they were afraid of the people there. Have you ever been afraid of something or someone? And sometimes we get worried around people who are different from us. Have you ever been worried around people, someone who's just because they're different? Well, our big idea is I can trust God. Our story is about two men, Caleb and Joshua, the only two of the spies who thought that God's people could live in the land. They trusted that God would be with them. So what happened next? Did they trust God and go into the promised land? Well, check out the video today. Have your parents go to the email that I sent them and click on the link that allows you to watch the video and do some really fun activities. As always, I've loved being with you today. I hope I get to see you in person real soon. And did you know that the Bible Box Store is now open on the first and third Sundays? Well, we hope to see you soon. Bye for now, kids. All right, church. Pastor Lance has a special war for you today. But before we get into it, we have a special video to show you detailing our missions initiative here at church. Will you join me in watching this video? Good morning, Puget Sound. My name is Vic. I was the missions director for several years at Trinity Church. When we united, we brought our 11 missionaries over with us. They are a very dedicated group of people. They really want to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in their home nation. I have visited several of their nations, and we've had the missionaries come and visit us at Trinity Church and share their hearts with us. 
Each year in October, Trinity Church would do a missions pledge drive to raise funds for the coming year. Last October, the drive did not have the success as we'd like. We were able to make up the gap with the Trinity cash balance. We are now at the point where we can no longer do that. And we are making a request for you to help us do this, to, to continue giving until October again, where we'll do another pledge drive. Again, uh, giving to missionaries is a blessing. They can never pay you back, and that's some of the great, greatest rewards from heaven. I can encourage you to do so, and thank you very much. Well, here's my challenge to us today, PJ Sound Foursquare. As we come together, uh, as, as united as one church, better together, Trinity Church and PJ Sound Foursquare, in, in the area of global missions. Both churches have had incredible history of, of missions and, and, and engagement with missionaries and local churches and ministries all around the world, seeing the kingdom come and, and seeing ministry and fruit all around the world. But we want to continue that, church, as we come together and united as one church. And I really believe that as we come together, we are better together in, in our area of global ministry and mission support. But as Vic was saying earlier, uh, Trinity has an incredible heritage and in, 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 uh, commitment each October to do a pledge drive to support global missions. And, and over the last few months with the, the, the pandemic and the transition, there's been a shortfall of, of finances to be able to continue to support some of the ministries and missionaries uh, supported through Trinity Church. And we want to continue to make that, uh, that commitment until this next October where we will uh, re-engage the October Pledge Month. We want to continue with, with these commitments that these missionaries and workers are relying on. So many of them are on the front lines of ministry and, and, and engaging with, with underage people groups and, and bringing the kingdom of God to places like never before. And we don't want them to have to worry about their support and their finances in this time especially in the midst of this pandemic. So this weekend, I want to ask you to prayerfully consider what your commitment might be in a one-time love offering. Next weekend, we will actually take the offering. But if you're ready to, today to give, to sow into the kingdom in the area of missions, uh, be blessed. We want to encourage you to give today a, a one-time love offering to make up this deficit. Some of you guys might want to go home and prayerfully consider what your commitment might be next weekend when we actually take the offering. And be blessed in that as you go talk to your family and, and spend some, some time with the Lord. Some of you may be saying, Lord, I'm feeling the stirring in the area of engagement with global missions. Maybe I haven't given on a regular basis to missions and missionaries. Well, this is your opportunity to prayerfully consider maybe a monthly support towards global missions here at Peter Sound Foursquare. And we want to encourage you to be blessed in that. Church, as a, as a mission, mi, uh, missionary myself, as, a, as somebody that's lived overseas and in, in disaster and war zones all around the world, I know that there are so many times where, you, where missionaries feel alone and isolated and, and they're on the front lines in places where there's a different culture and different language and people that don't, uh, that don't look like them, don't talk like them, but they are out there giving their lives on the, on the front lines of bringing the gospel to people that don't know Jesus yet. And we want to continue to stand with, with missionaries and workers that are doing that right now in the midst of this pandemic and hard times. And so I want to challenge you this morning, church. Would you consider continuing to sow into the kingdom in this area of global missions here at Petersound Foursquare as we work to, to continue to build uh, our church, Petersound Foursquare, our area of, of ministry and, and missions to new heights like never before. I'm excited, church. God bless you as you prayerfully consider giving here at Petersound Foursquare to missions. God bless. Hey, good morning, church. Good to have you here, Pastor Lance, uh, with you this morning. And listen, if you're with us for the first time or the first time in a long time, welcome home. Welcome home. It's great to have you here today. Um, you know, there's this YouTube channel that I like to watch. My wife thinks I'm a goof, but I like to watch this YouTube channel sometimes when I'm uh, kind of bored and uh, I don't know, you know, there's nothing else to watch. But this guy intrigues me. He's a guy who likes to take old tools or old items um, that are all rusty and corroded and restore them back to their original place. So uh, it's like he, I remember one time, I think it was an egg beater he found and it was like an old rusted dented thing. It obviously didn't twist anymore and a handle, you know, one of the handle kind. And so I remember uh, him, I, th I think it was that, but he was working on that, that whole idea the thing about what he does that's kind of interesting to me is he'll 
take it apart piece by piece. He'll, he'll bring out his wire brush. He'll bring out his sander. He'll, he'll even use the, um, I don't know what it's called, the, the, where you sandblast the thing and put it in a little machine. Sometimes he'll bring out a grinder and a hammer to kind of knock out all the dents. And it's amazing to me how he'll take these, these old rusted up pieces of um, just tools or items that you might have or have had laying around your house and had discarded them. But he takes and brings them back to their original state. Then he paints them and he puts oil on them. And somehow in the middle of all that, there becomes this beautiful, rustic, old looking tool that's brought back to its original state. I love watching that because it just takes the, this, the detail of all the little things that he has to do. It really is, it's exciting for me. Listen, this morning I want to start a two week sermon series. The sermon series is called The Dad You Never Had. I know Father's Day is next weekend. Uh, I wanted to take two weeks to talk about Father's Day. Somebody asked me the other day, why would you talk about Father's Day two weeks in a row, or fathers two weeks in a row? You know, I just want you to know, um, the, the, the role, but by the way, the reason I'm talking about Father's Day is for two reasons. One, I think it's super important, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But the second is because a lot of you dads stay home on Father's Day. <laughs> I want to make sure, no, I'm kidding. I, see, I figured this way. If I have to work on Father's Day, then you got to come to church. Listen, I, I want you to understand there's something special about Father's Day. There's something really special. I, I literally think that the, this message is one of those messages that are of the utmost importance for me. In fact, I think it's the most important thing I could talk to you about today. I believe the role of fatherhood is the single most powerful ever established role in heaven or on earth. The role of father is literally filled with immense power. Get this, on purpose or on accident, uh, in person or absent, the role of father has made a significant impact on your life, on my life. I'm telling you, it has. You listen, there's no more revealing question. Listen, it's interesting to me. There's no more revealing question that you can ask a person than this. Tell me about something good about your father. Tell me something good about your father. You, you'll find answers that you may love find answers that you don't love. Sometimes you'll hear words of affirmation and joy. My dad was great. He super built me up. It was amazing. Sometimes you'll hear words of pain and sorrow. Well, he didn't. He could have. He this. He that. Other times you'll hear words of hatred. And at very worst, you'll hear words of indifference. I don't care. It's interesting to me that the role of father, the role of fatherhood is one of those roles that seems to have uh, an answer to any person you talk to, one way or another, on purpose or by default. This morning in Father's Day, I want to unpack a little bit of the role of fatherhood, both of that as a child from me and as a father also from me. i got to be honest with you, this particular message is one of those messages that it's not an easy one for me to jump into. Not because I didn't like the role. I love the role of being a dad. In fact, I, I just I, I felt such healing and restoration from being a dad. That part of fatherhood I love. Uh, the, the part of fatherhood that's hard for me is the being <laughs> the son. Being a son. <laughs> and I say that through tears, uh, partly because I didn't have the storybook relationship that I had. And that place of being a son was a difficult one for me. <laughs> Let's pray. Jesus, we need you a bunch today. I know I do. So help me today to uh, lead your people through this moment and even into some healing into their own, in all of our lives, mine included, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. If there's one person in the Bible I identify with, the most. I think it's young King David. Actually, it's David before he was King David. Just David. There's something about him in his youth that, man, I identify with. There's a lot of him. Remember, he was the youngest of the sons. Actually, he was the eighth son of eight sons, right? So we don't know how many daughters were in the family, but we know this, that his dad, Jesse, was a sheep herder in Bethlehem, right? And there's something about that place of Bethlehem. We know that he was a keeper of sheep. We know David was strong. We know that he was soft. We also know that he was tenacious. Right? There's something about David that, to me, I could relate to the most. 
being the youngest son in my own family, uh, I know that there are places of my own hurt that I experienced that seem a little similar to David. And uh, uh, without boring you, I could tell you more about that story at some point. But I would just tell you that there are places of healing that Jesus wants to bring to all of us, me included, in this area of fatherhood. And we see in the life of King David so much of what God was doing when we couldn't see what he was doing. And I just want to take some time to unpack King David's life a little bit as a youth before he was King David, so that we can begin to see some of the things about David that brought him to the place that made him the leader he was, that made him the, uh, the, the one who's referenced over a thousand times in the Bible as, the, as the, the, the one through whom Jesus would come, as the son of David. Right? You know, it's interesting that Jesus wasn't referred to as the son of Abraham or the son of Jacob. He was referred to as the son of David. He most often wasn't even referred to as his own uh, Jesse. I mean, there were the, there, there's so much about Jesus that was referred to as the son of David uh, or even the son of Joseph. It's interesting to me. Listen about King David's life. We know him that he was a man of great intentions. We know, remember the time that King David brought tried to bring the ark into the, the city and he uh, ended up doing it wrong and then doing it right and, and dancing before the Lord. We know he was a man of war. We know he was a man of war because when he wanted to build a temple for the Lord, God said, no, you have blood on your hands. Uh, your son will do that, That uh, which is King Solomon. Um, and, and we also know that he was a man of mistakes, right? We know that David made some mistakes along the way, but his heart was supple, his heart was yielded, his heart was open to what God could do. The thing we love and know most about King David was that he was a man after the heart of God. We know that he was a man after God's own heart, spoken of in the Bible, describing him. If you have your Bibles, open them up to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 16 obviously takes place after 1 Samuel chapter 15, and in 15, we see the, the prophet Samuel literally going to talk with Saul, the first king of Israel, and him making some big mistakes and disqualifying himself from being king. Then God charges the prophet Samuel with going to anoint the new king. And here's how the story begins. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, it says this, Finally, the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as the king of Israel. Now, fill your horn with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find the man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my new king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? If, I, if Saul hears about it, then he'll kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons that you are to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. And when he arrived to Bethlehem, the leaders to the town came to him afraid. What's wrong? They asked, did you come in peace? Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. He says this, purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the, the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them that he had invited to. Verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, Surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge his appearance by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't make decisions the way you do. People judge by outward appearances, but the Lord looks at a person's thoughts and intentions. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab, to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, This is not one that the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shema, uh, Shama, but Samuel said, Neither is this one the Lord's chosen. In the same way, seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, Are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse replied. But he's out in the fields watching the sheep. Send for him at once, Samuel said, and we will not sit down until we and sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was ruddy and handsome, with pleasant eyes. And the Lord said, This is the one, anoint him. So David stood there among the brothers, among his brothers. Samuel took the olive oil that he had had and poured it over David's head. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him on that day, from that day on. 
Then Samuel returned to Ramah. And there's so much I want to take from this passage and share with you. And, and in time, we'll get to do that. But for the sake of today, I just want, if there's one thing you could take away from the message today, I want you to know this. I want you to know that God sees you. And God has always seen you. Some of you have wondered if God sees me and God has always seen me, then why didn't God protect me? Or why didn't God keep me from? Or why did he allow the crazy things to happen in my life? I don't know the answers to all those, but I can tell you that the Bible refers to God as Jehovah, I'm sorry, El Roi, El Roi, L R O I. It's actually pronounced El Roy, right? And literally, you know what that means? It means that God sees. God sees. He basically means God understands you, right? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that God is going to always keep you from every level of harm because there's something in the pain that God will use. Now, God doesn't initiate pain. God's not in hoping that we'll incur pain. But there's something about the pain of, of, of heartache that God somehow allows in our life that produces something in us. And again, it's not an easy thing, but there's something about that. When I look at the life of young David, uh, they've come to a stark realization that David incurred much pain. David incurred much pain. The pain of isolation, the, the pain of fear, the pain of rejection. Hmm. The truth is, pain is like a yellow light at an intersection. Most of us get to an intersection and we see the yellow light and we want to either slow down and stop or just push down the gas pedal and rip through it. Pain's like that, right? Some of us want to just rip through the yellow, interse- yellow light at the intersection because we want to get past it. We don't want to get stopped to have to deal with it. Sometimes with our pain, most of us experience the pain and we just want to make it go away. We want to just push the pedal down and just get through it. And some of us need to stop and ask Jesus what he wants us to do, learn, and f- more than anything, not just learn, but find healing in the midst of it. Right? There's pain that happens, that happens in the world we live in, and God wants to bring healing to you in the midst of it. Somehow, and again, I wish there was other ways. I wrote this down as the title of the sermon. The sermon series is called The Dad You Never Had, but this particular sermon is called Discovering Passion Through Pain. Discovering Passion Through Pain. If there's one thing that David discovered in the midst of all of his pain, of isolation, of of rejection, one of the things that David learned the most was that David found hope in the midst of his pain. Somehow in the middle of the craziness, David found hope. Psalm 39, it's an interesting psalm. It's one of the first ones that David actually penned that we know of, that he wrote down that's in the Bible. One of the psalms in Psalm 39, and we know that because it's, it's written uh, as one of the first ones, it's stated that way. But we also know when we read Psalm 39, we almost get this insight into his David's thought life as that whole scene was unraveling in front of us just a few minutes ago in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And we see young David standing there. We'll read Psalm 39, and you'll begin to see the heart of David. You'll begin to see the inner thoughts of David. And this is a difficult psalm to read because there's so much here I think he wants us to see in the midst of it. If we could take a minute and just carve that day out or that season out in David's life when he was a shepherd, when all seven of the brothers were, were at home and uh, where all, all of them were part of the deal, uh, when, when, when Jesse was asked by Samuel to bring all of his sons in because one of them would eventually become the king of the nation. Hmm. It's interesting that David didn't get invited to that request from the prophet. He didn't get invited as one of the sons to that moment where there could be. In other words, his dad didn't think much of him. Moreover, his brothers didn't even mention him. When the prophet went through and said, not you, not you, not you. Hmm. Interesting. Listen to the heart of David in Psalm 39. I said to myself, this is in his brain, I said to myself, I will watch what I do and not sin in what I say. I will curb my tongue when the ungodly are around me. But as I stood there in silence, not even speaking of the good things, the turmoil within me grew to the bursting point. 
my thoughts grew hot within me and they began to burn, igniting a fire of words. How many of you know how that feels, right? Imagine David's having these thoughts of wanting to say, but he doesn't because he just holds it back. Look what it says in verse 4. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth really is or will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, that my life is, flee- is, it, that my life is uh, fleeing away. My life is no longer than the width of my hand. An entire lifetime is just a moment to you. Human existence is but a breath. We are but merely moving shadows and all of our busy rushing, all of our busy rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth for someone else to spend. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? I put my hope in you. My only hope is in you. Rescue me from my rebellion. For even fools mock me when I rebelled. When I rebel, I am silent before you. I won't say a word, for my punishment is from you. Please don't punish me anymore. I am exhausted with the blows from your hand. When you discipline people, for, when you discipline people for their sins, their lives can be crushed like the life of a moth. Human existence is frail as breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cries for help. Don't ignore my tears, for I am your guest, a traveler passing through as my ancestors before me. Spare me so I can smile again before I'm, before I'm gone and exist no more. But you can just hear the cry of David on the inside, the pain that he was experiencing, not being recognized by his father, not being brought up by his, their, his seven brothers. In this moment, and, and we, we hear this deep inner turmoil and this deep inner pain. Some of you can totally relate to that deep inner turmoil and that deep inner pain that you don't understand me. Now, now some of us allowed that to just lash out. Some of us have just kept it in and bottled it in. I love how David dealt with some of this by coming to the Lord and just getting open and saying, God, I can't do this. Hmm, interesting. David found hope in the Lord. Listen, I'm convinced of one thing. I need you to write this down. You will never find hope until you actually need to find hope. You'll never find hope until you actually need to find hope. I'm convinced that the pain drove David to need to find hope. The, 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 the awayness, the separateness, the isolatedness, the pain of this caused David to hunger for hope. There was something about this that, that though the, the enemy meant harm by creating pain, by creating isolation, somehow God created space for David to find healing and find hope in the middle of it all. Now understand something, David was the youngest here in this family. And as the youngest son, uh, you could tell that it wasn't a wealthy family. Jesse wasn't a wealthy family. He was a shepherd. The shepherd, unfortunately, a culture was of the lowest class in the society, so their finances weren't probably great. We know that simply because one of the sons was doing most of the shepherding. And we, we, we know that because usually a wealthier shepherd would have hired someone to come and do that. In this case, David was the guy, right? So David was to them nothing more than a, a hired hand. In other words, he wasn't even included as one of the sons when invited to the prophetic uh, utterance of what God was saying through the prophet Samuel. It's interesting too because they went to Bethlehem and Bethlehem wasn't a huge place, probably five miles around. And Bethlehem had two parts. There was Bethlehem where people lived and then Bethlehem it was called Ephrata, which, which was literally, we might say Ephrata, but, but Bethlehem was that, that in Ephrata was this place that what shepherds would go uh, and they were, they were kind of nomadic around that five mile range and they would stay in one spot. But most of the time uh, there were... Uh, there, there were just shepherds doing that. All the guys who were much more wealthy lived in the other part of Bethlehem. Interesting. One of the most difficult passages in all of the Bible that I read here is in verse 11. I think in all of the Bible, it just makes me cringe on the inside when I read verse 11. Samuel the prophet asked Jesse, his dad. This is what, what he did. Samuel the prophet asked, Are these all the sons you have? Hmm. Just the question being phrased just makes me cringe. What, 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 what dad gets asked that question? What dad needs to be asked that question? Are these all the sons you have? This is Jesse's reply. He says this, there's still the youngest. The youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out watching the sheep. Still the youngest. He doesn't even call him by name. 
Doesn't even say, hey, look at, uh, and interestingly enough, that at one point, all the other seven brothers, most of them would have been the youngest son at some point. Most of them would have understood the isolation and loneliness of David because once a new came along, the roles got switched at some point. They would understand. Clearly, their hearts hadn't been, when, when, even when, when the first came up and, and Samuel was told by the Lord, don't judge by his appearance because his heart is not right. Maybe the isolation and the loneliness caused that first son, that second son, that third son, caused them to harden their hearts both towards God and towards their family. I don't know. Maybe your heart's hard. And God wants to soften it with you. It says that David, we know that David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. I often wonder what it takes to become a man after God's own heart. What does it take to become a person whose heart is completely after the Lord? Is it a great family that produces a heart after God? Is it a great church that produces a heart after God? How about a great school? Is it a great school that creates a heart after God? Man, all these are great things. And I think we should pursue all of those things to pursue great churches and make great churches and go to great schools and become better schools and great families. Man, we should become better families than we maybe came from. But listen, I believe in the middle of the brokenness, in the middle of the quiet, in the middle of the stillness of David's life, when he was isolated and alone out there with those sheep on the hillside of Bethlehem Ephratah, that it was something there that God actually birthed desperation. Desperation for hope. Desperation for something far greater than him. A desperation that says, I've got to have hope. The thing I love about David was, unlike his brothers, there was a softening that happened in the midst of the pain. His brothers experienced the isolation and pain like he did, but instead of softening, it appears to me that they got harder. And maybe that's what happened to you. Maybe in your heart, you've decided, I will not do that, and, and you're harboring unforgiveness, and it's hanging out in you. And for some, it's been a couple of years. For some, it's been 40 years. For some, your father has passed, and you've been hanging on. And God is saying, it's time. Will you release that unto me and experience the forgiveness? A heart after God is never found in the excesses of life. I think a heart after God is often found in the desperation, pain, and disappointment, and the hurts and the trials of life. That's hard. It's hard, man, but it's, it's hard. But somehow in the middle of the brokenness, when I think of the lives of people who had their wrestling moments with God, who had those, the, those places, and we could go on and on, and I could tell you all of the, 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 the turmoils when Peter denied Jesus three times. There was something about that place and that time of the pain of what he felt and the regret and the shame, and that somehow in the middle of that produced within him a passion to eventually say, I will lay my life down. There was something about the moments when we see all of these men and women of God. But when we see uh, over and over again, Rachel and Hagar and Ruth, and, and we see all of these, these strong women of God at some level, there, there was these moments where they just said, hey, listen, in the middle of the pain, in the middle of the I'm going to allow myself to allow it to turn into passion after God. Hmm. There's a story of a wise old man speaking to a young man wanting to discover what passion was really all about, a passion for the Lord. He asked the old sage, what does it take to discover a passion for God? The old wise sage said, a passion? The young man said, yes, a passion. Come with me, the old sage told him, walking down to the lake and up to their waist in the water. The old sage said, bend over a little and put your head under the water, young man. The young man did as he was told, and the old sage put his hand on the neck of the young man and held him under. After a minute or so, the young man started to fight to get his head up. And in one last final gasp for air, the young man thrust his head up and cried out, Are you trying to kill me? The old sage said this, When you fight for air, when you fight for air, this is what passion feels like. When your desire for passion matches your desire for air, you will truly discover passion. When your desire for passion matches your desire for air, you'll truly find passion. Hmm. Seems difficult, doesn't it? It seems like it's not fair. That why the pain and the trials. That's why I think in a lot of things, I don't think God doesn't make pain and trial happen. 
The, the, the pain and the trial can, can be useful, and God can allow it. Now, now again, some of us have ex- experienced excruciating pain. And I'm not telling you that God allowed that to happen so he could say, look, I'm going to make you stronger. I'm saying in the midst of the excruciating pain that happened in our lives, God can use it. My question for you, will you allow him to use it, or will you let that pain take you down and harden you? Hmm. Some of you need to make an appointment with a counselor to deal with some of the pain of your past. I know that when I've spoken to my counselor, when, I, when, I've, when I've talked with him about my, my issues as a child or my issues with my biological father or my stepdad, when I've talked to my counselor about all that, here's, here's one thing I know. I know that pastors are really good advice, advice givers, but we're terrible counselors, right? So you, you, and I know that because I have sought counsel. Uh, I remember going to counseling uh, and, uh, for my marriage, just trying to get my marriage in a healthy place back in 2010. For 17 months, I went every week because I realized there was so much brokenness and hurt in me. And I realized clearly that I am not a counselor. So if you try to make an appointment to see me as counseling, I'm going to send you off to one because I'm telling you, you need someone who can help you unpack some of those wounds and put definition around your pain and bring you to the place where you can realize that your pain can be used one way or the other to draw you closer or push you farther away. So allow Jesus to do that. Some of you need to make an appointment. Listen, here's one of the things. Until you get in to see your counselor, let me, I wrote a couple things down. Let's do what David did, right? Let's take a look at Psalm 39. What are some of the things that David did? David, first of all, curbed his tongue, right? Listen, do what David did. Curb your tongue. Psalm 39, 1 says, I said to myself, I will watch what I do and not sin in what I say. I will curb my tongue when the ungodly are around me. In other words, hurt people hurt people, right? So some of us have been snappy in hurting people, and at some level, we need to do ourselves a favor that even in the midst of our pain, we need to decide to curb our tongue. Yeah, but Lance, what if it's hurting too bad? Well, of course, make your appointment with see somebody who's a professional, but you begin to curb your tongue. David did it in the middle of the pain. David did it in the middle of the rejection. David did it in the middle of misunderstanding. David did it in the middle of all of his pain curbed his tongue and because he didn't want to let his, his tongue become that which would hurt another, right? Number two, do what David did. Cry out to the Lord. It says in uh, Psalm uh, 39, 4, it says, The Lord reminded me how brief my time on earth would be. Remind me that my days are numbered and that my life is fleeing away. My life is no longer than the width of my hand. An entire lifetime is just a moment to you. Human existence is but a breath, but we are merely moving shadows. All your busy rushing ends to nothing. We heap up wealth for some and to spend, and so the Lord, uh, so Lord, and so Lord, where do I put my hope? I put my hope in you. Listen, I love the fact that David just cried out to the Lord, and he just simply said, "Hey, look, this seems meaningless. This seems terrible. All the things I'm doing." end up benefiting someone else. And, and yet David said, listen, I'm going to cry out to you, Jesus. So listen, in the middle of your pain, cry out to the Lord, I'm telling you. And then finally this, what did David do? David didn't take things into his own hands, right? Psalm 39, 8 says this, rescue me from my rebellion, for even the fools mock me when I rebel. Listen, some of us want to take things into our own hands and make it right. I, that's why I think it's so important to get some wise counsel, to know what it is to do. Every one of us has a, a relationship, either really good or really, or really bad, or pain in our own lives. And though I'm speaking about fathers today, I know that there are many of you who deal with pain. And oftentimes our reaction is to just take it into our own hands and fix this or do that or solve that or move this or guard that. And, and I'm telling you, sometimes it ends up becoming more painful in the lives of you and those around you. Right? In other words, don't take it into your own hands. Psalm 39, 8, rescue me from my rebellion, for even fools mock me when I rebel. Remember, your rebellion, your pushing away, you trying to solve it yourself, will only result oftentimes in rebellion. Hmm. It never seems to go well when we try to put things in our own hands to solve our pain. It never seems to work well. Now, the people I've talked to, it's not really seemed to work well. You know, sometimes I feel like that corroded tool uh, in that guy's hands who takes the things apart. Sometimes I feel like I'm on his workbench where he's, you know, got the wire brush or he breaks out the sandblaster and he's working on a place. Sometimes I feel like he has a grinder or a hammer and he's beating the the things in this old tool of my life of the pain. The good news is, is I know that there's an end to that YouTube channel. I know that there's an end to the story because it's a nice little encapsulated thing. And I also know this. I know this about my life and in your life. The brokenness, the hurt, and the pain can either leave you corroded and rusted and bent up or restored 
and brand new. It all depends on how you choose to allow that to happen in your own life. My prayer for you today is that you'll allow God to restore you. You'll allow God to bring you back to that place. And he might have to take you apart. He might have to add a little elbow grease to the places in your life. But if you'll allow him, he'll restore you. He's the maker of all new things. So I want to pray for you this morning. Can we do that? Lord, thanks for today. Thank you for an opportunity to spend some time with your people. Thank you for your grace. God, I ask today that you would help those people today, like myself, who still experience the rawness and the pain. The pain of the wounds of a father. God, I ask that you would bring healing to those places. I pray that we would climb up on your workbench and allow you to do the work. And like David, not grow bitter and hard, but cry out to you. Maybe that's you today. and You've been running from the workbench of God and you're fearful that the screwdrivers are going to hurt and the wire brushes are going to be painful. I can tell you that there's an end to those moments and God wants to bring a clarity and an understanding and a healing and a usefulness for the pain. So God, do that in our lives today. We yield our lives to you and we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, I want to make sure that you uh, come back next week for Father's Day. I'm looking forward to that moment. So can you do that? It'd be great to have you here for part two of The Dad You Never Had. And let's allow it to happen. Um, Listen, this is Sync Up Sunday. And maybe you've not uh, synced up, sunk up, gotten involved in a life group, uh, uh, one of our service groups, the worship team, our youth group, our greeting team. Will you make sure and go online and sign up for one of those things? Literally, you can go down to the drop-down menu and sign up and say, I want to be a volunteer. I want to serve somewhere. And you allow us. Christina shows on our team. She'll contact you and, and help you find your place. But connect so that you can be a part of what's going on here. Listen, I love you. Have a great afternoon. God bless you. Hey, before we go, I want to remind you that you can find all of the information at PugetSoundFoursquare.com on the Church Center app, or on our socials at Sound Foursquare. Church family, let's continue to be on mission together. The mission of Puget Sound Foursquare is to send, loved, mended, and trained people out into our communities. We do this by showing up, syncing up, and serving. How will you do this this week? Just a friendly reminder that if you're meeting with us online, that we will be here at 10 a.m., But we are also meeting in person at church at our 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. service. And all our kids' classes are open. I can't wait to be with everyone again next week. Be safe, take care, and we love you, church. See you later.